All right. Well, welcome everybody. Um, what a nice audience. Thank you for being here today. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Troy Kilpatrick. I'm the executive director here at the Journey Museum and Learning Center. And uh, we've officially started recognizing 50 years since 1972, June 9th, 1972. And today, uh, uh, one of our goals, a big goal of our education committee is to create healing conversations uh, in our community. And we started that earlier today with Gerald Yellowhawk here providing a blessing and we had community stories here in the theater and um i'd like to uh, i know dr hausman can't be here but i think he could hear you guys if you all give him a big round of applause um kind of a long story um uh, today was supposed to be the day i got to meet steve in person okay we were introduced on zoom by dr eric zimmer about two and a half years ago and the idea back then was let's write an imls grant and uh, work on making sure that we do a more thorough job of creating history of our native american communities experience in 1972 from the flood right that's how that all started right steve he's nodding uh -huh. his head um and so 2020 is what it was right where we were all figured out we didn't know what Zoom was. Uh, and Corey Christensen, who is here on our research team, who now lives in Pier, um, her and Steve and I kind of kept the communications going. And we wrote a couple different versions of grants. We didn't get them to begin with. Um, and basically, we kind of gave up on the idea of having a grant that would help us commemorate 50 years. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, we're at the Muse Mountain Plains Regional Museum Conference. I got an email and they said, hey, you guys are back in consideration. If you could quick give us some updated stuff. So Corey and I are at the Ramcota in Sioux Falls writing updates to this CARES grant and lo and behold, we got it. So <laughs> part of why we're able to bring these programs to you guys is well, Steve was committed even before there was a grant. We were committed before there was a grant. But we're what we can do is make recordings of all these programs and make sure that this history is not lost in this research. And we will obviously need that CARES money going forward. Um, quick note on the journey. We were open 133 days in 2020, 159 in 2021. It's not normal for us. It'll never be normal yet um, as we find our way back. So support from our community and these types of things is a huge deal. But we have to keep doing this kind of work. Um, Steve, you jump in. I don't know if I've got the appropriate bio for yourself, but um, Dr. Hausman is at the University of St. Thomas. And he is his expertise is in American history, environmental history, history of the American West and Native American history. And he's written a manuscript that focuses on the history of the 1972 Rapid City flood, the roots of environmental injustice, and urban inequality among Native American communities in the West. The title of this program is Remembrance, Resilience, and Rebuilding Lessons from 1972. Dr. Hausman, you correct me and add on wherever you can there. Oh, and we should say, we made a tough call yesterday. Steve called me. I was grabbing a quick lunch. He was not feeling well. He was trying to decide, do I get on a plane? Do I worry about having COVID-19? We said out of abundance of caution, let's just do this on Zoom versus flying and being in person. So I think we want to thank Dr. Hausman for making that decision. And we're doing this the safe way, and we're going to get it all recorded. But Steve, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, at the end, we'll have questions. I'm going to make sure we talk into the mic so we can record them. Uh, we are recording the program, uh, but I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Hausman. Thank you guys for being here today. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And first, um, more than anything else, I want to say how sorry I am that I cannot be there uh, and join you in person today. As uh, Troy was just indicating, uh, just a couple hours before my uh, flight out to Rapid City yesterday, I started to feel very sick with COVID symptoms. And then not long after that, I found out that a friend that I had been sharing a hotel room with over this past weekend tested positive for COVID. And uh, you probably don't know if you can hear my voice, but I'm pretty 
sick right now and I'm waiting the results of my latest COVID test as we speak. And as Troy said, out of an abundance of caution and also at the urging of my wife who is a doctor and has been dealing with COVID all through this pandemic, I opted not to fly out for this week's events, but it wasn't an easy decision to make. Um, sorry in advance during this presentation for probably pausing quite a bit to drink water for my voice being so hoarse and probably for coughing a great deal. Um, Nonetheless, all of that aside, I'm truly honored to be uh, here uh, sharing this and, and, and being with all of you today. I appreciate all of you joining me. And I want to especially thank Troy and the staff at the Journey Museum and the City of Rapid City for inviting me to participate in uh, the week's events uh, as we remember and reflect on the sorrow that struck Rapid City 50 years ago this week. Um, the 1972 flood was, of course, a tragedy. But as a historian, I firmly believe, kind of at the root of my beliefs as a historian, is that every tragedy also presents an opportunity for those in the present to learn from and to build from. I think that this is the power and the usefulness of history itself, that even from the darkest moments of the human past uh, are offered paths into a better future if we are willing to look for them. Um, that idea of finding meaning in the history of a tragedy is what I'm going to be focusing on today, sort of the, the through line through today's uh, uh, talk that I'm going to be uh, uh, sharing with all of you as I talk about the history of the flood and how it was intertwined with the native history of Rapid City. So I'm going to speak for probably about a half hour or so, which will leave us about a half hour or so for questions and comments. Most everyone here, I'm sure, knows the history of the 1972 flood, but it's worth repeating the basics nonetheless. Excuse me. On the evening of June 9th, 1972, a massive storm parked itself over the eastern and the northern portions of the Black Hills, causing torrential rain which swelled all of the dozens of creeks and streams throughout the region, including Rapid Creek. And as the rain fell with increasing intensity on that night of June 9th, the spillways of Canyon Lake Dam clogged, causing pressure to build and that dam to fail. Millions of gallons of water rushed down Rapid Creek and through downtown Rapid City, and it was this dam's collapse which turned the flood from uh, a disaster to a cataclysm, and which caused the brunt of the flood's property damage and the loss of life. At least 238 killed, over 1,500 homes destroyed and damaged, and at least $100 million in damage all told. And everyone in Rapid City suffered that night. Nobody in Rapid City emerged from the night of June 9th unaffected, whether they lost a family member, a home, a business, a friend, or a neighbor. But the flood did not mete out its devastation equally. Exact numbers are difficult to come by, but one government source estimated that perhaps 33 of the 238 confirmed deaths were Native Americans in Rapid City, which would be approximately 13% of the death toll. The true figure is impossible to know. I personally believe that it's likely a little bit higher. Many Native people from nearby reservations lived in Rapid City seasonally, making the demographic size of the Native community in Rapid in the 1960s and 1970s difficult to pin down. Many also lived in more transient dwellings along the creek itself, making them difficult to count in data. Displacement figures from the flood are equally hard to estimate. Estimate. One report from about a year after the flood estimated that 18 to 20 percent of those displaced were minority families, which is three times the percentage of non-white people who lived in Rapid City, according to the 1970 census. And the number of Native people killed by the flood, I think, can be fairly estimated to be at the low end. 33 to 35, and at the high end as many as 40, which on the low end is 13 to 15%, and on the high end is nearly 20% of the total flood victims. And regardless of which end of that spectrum you choose, it's significantly higher than the, 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 the ratio of the native population in Rapid City in 1970, which according to that year's census was 2,112 people out of a city population of just under 44,000, a little under 5% of the city's overall population. That kind of inequality is a textbook, to, excuse me, a textbook example of environmental injustice and is the kind of thing that demands historical explanation. In explaining that today, uh, we need to talk a bit about the history of Rapid City as a native place. So let's start back at the beginning. 
the place where we're all sitting was native space well before it became Rapid City, or in my case where I'm sitting right now, well before it became Chicago. Um, and it remains so, of course, today. Prior to American arrival and the illegal dispossession of the Black Hills at the end of the 19th century, the Lakota, the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, the Kiowa, all called the Black Hills home, living along the banks of Rapid Creek, among many other people who have done so since time immemorial. Yet even after the US government claimed and seized the Black Hills in the 1870s and 1880s, Native people maintained Rapid City as part of their geography. From the 1880s onwards, annual Stockman's Days festivities in Rapid City always involved Native people. Photographs like this one here of Stockman's Days festivals held in Rapid in the late 19th and the early 20th centuries show Lakotas and other Native people of all ages standing on sidewalks, seeing the sights, attending events alongside white onlookers. Others took part in the events themselves, uh, competed in rodeos or in horse races or participated in parades like the one seen here. I believe this picture is from the late 1880s or early 18. 90s. Um, Lakotas from Pine Ridge and other nearby reservations also continued to visit sacred sites throughout the Black Hills during the same era, including Hot Springs and Wind Cave. So despite dispossession of these homelands, Native people maintained an active presence throughout Rapid City in the Black Hills. They did not disappear despite the best efforts by the U.S. government to make that a reality. That was never actually the case. For much of the late 19th and early 20th century, the Rapid City Indian School served as an additional hub in Rapid City's urban native geography. Founded in 1898, the Rapid City School ensured that native students would always be present in Rapid City as students to be sure, but also as runaways, as people who were fleeing from the Rapid City Indian School, which was a common occurrence at this and similar institutions around the United States. Students who ran away from the Rapid City Indian School regularly were able to make use of the native community in and around Rapid City as a means of avoiding school officials. Levi Black Bear was one such student. <clears throat> After running away in 1916, school administrators, quote, made inquiry at the camps in Rapid City, but were unable to find him for days before eventually catching the boy. And I'm quoting here from the record of the Rapid City Indian School uh, housed at the National Archives in Kansas City. The following year, a young girl named Margaret Tutu also ran away, and she hid for a time, again quoting those records, in camp about three miles north of Rapid City before officials were able to catch her and return her to the school. A young boy named Albert Yankton similarly, quote, lived in and around the camps for a week before leaving for home after originally arriving in town and deciding not to enroll, as was his original intention. For young Albert Yankton and other students escaping from the Rapid City Indian School, the Native community residing in and around Rapid City served as an alternative to the kind of assimilationist education that was the reason for these schools' existence. Try as they might, school officials couldn't control students who were often homesick and desperate to see friends and family. The ability for students running away from the Rapid City Indian School to find refuge in and around Rapid is a testament to the presence, to the size, and to the tightly knit nature of the Native community in the city during the early 20th century. Yet, whites in Rapid City created an often unwelcome atmosphere for Rapid City's Native community during the first few decades of the 20th century. Cecilia Hernandez Montgomery, who was an Ogallala Lakota woman born in 1910 on Pine Ridge, lived throughout her life in several towns in the Northern Plains and in the Black Hills region during the first half of the 20th century, including in Rapid City. She would later write, and I'm quoting her here, that they had signs in businesses saying no Indians allowed. And one time she reported, I went looking for a house and when I showed up, they found out I was an Indian and they said, sorry, it's been rented out. The journalist, Tim Gallego, lived in Rapid City and remember, had similar memories, recalling that once he applied for a job at a local bakery, I'm quoting him here, uh, 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 when he was a teenager. And the owner looked at the application and then looked at me and finally he said, I don't hire anyone from the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. And he dismissed me with that comment. By doing things like disallowing the use of public facilities, by denying them the right to rent or own pop property, by enforcing employment discrimination, white Rapid Cities did their best to deny Native people the upward economic mobility that in a lot of ways defined mid 20th century America and forced Native people to live in segregated sections around Rapid City throughout the first half of the 20th century. The most well-known of these was Oshkosh Camp. 
By the late 1920s, the Indian neighborhood along Rapid Creek became firmly established as part of Rapid City's uh, uh, geography. It was during that decade that Native people began living near the Warren Lamb Lumber Company plant on Omaha Street. Warren Lamb went, rented out land to its workers near Oshkosh Street, including its many Native workers. And soon this neighborhood bore the name Oshkosh Camp after the street itself. Cecilia Montgomery, who lived at that camp for a time, remembered it in a couple different ways. She said, quote, outdoor toilets were the rule and there was only one place where a person could get water. And Oshkosh Camp soon became one of the major native neighborhoods in, in Rapid City during the, the middle decades of the 20th century. By the 1930s, Oshkosh Camp was a neighborhood said to be of tar paper shacks and clapboard cabins, reported one person who lived there, located right along Rapid Creek. Yet, despite its impoverished living conditions, Oshkosh was nonetheless a community. Tim Gallego remembered, quote, one could travel the length of Rapid Creek to find Indians, Mexicans, and the poor white families of Rapid City. And among the people that lived there was paid Pedro Pete Pascual Torres, who came to Rapid City from Mexico in 1930 and stayed along Rapid Creek in Oshkosh Camp. And he remembered, quoting him here, that the Indian people were the first and the only ones to open their homes to us and to feed us. So to some in Rapid City, Oshkosh was simply a slum. But to those who lived there, it was also a community. Throughout the mid 20th century, however, whites in Rapid City increasingly saw Oshkosh as a dangerous zone of violence and of ill health. With this native neighborhood located close to downtown Rapid, white Rapid Cityans saw this place largely as a nuisance and even as a dangerous place. Beginning in the 1930s, the Rapid City Journal regularly reported in its pages on violence and crime in Oshkosh. One typical story reported, quote, a shooting at the Indian camp at the southern outskirts of Rapid City. City, which is under investigation from 1936. When two Native people left the Sioux Sanatorium, formerly the Rapid City Indian School, which closed in 1933 and became a hospital, uh, engaged in a fist fight in Oshkosh, a local judge deemed, quoting this judge, that the problem of patients from the Sioux Sanatorium mingling with citizens is a definite menace to the community. You'll note that this judge is kind of separating out, right, Native people in Rapid City from citizens that they are mingling with. A 1947 Rapid City Journal article decried a rubbish fire burning at the Indian camp on Omaha Street. And later that year in 1947, City Commissioner I.H. Chase vowed to improve sanitation in the area near Oshkosh Street in which scores of Indians dwell he said. One solution, the Rapid City Journal reported, was to build a 40-acre campground for Indians, which, quote, could be used by migratory Indian workers and would help overcome the present unsanitary conditions at the Rapid Creek Indian Camp. In short, simply replacing one segregated, underfunded, underserviced neighborhood with another. Another article from the early 1950s simply called Oshkosh a health menace. Oshkosh was a creation of segregation and unequal hiring and housing practices in Rapid City. And for white Rapid Cityans, it was also an undesirable blotch on the city's image and needed removing. And it was around this time in the 1950s that Rapid City officials made a concerted effort to do just that. And they at least partially succeeded. In the mid 1950s, the city bulldozed the neighborhood, destroying homes and in the process displaced many native people from Oshkosh. Many of them moved north to a federally funded housing project located just beyond the Rapid City city limits called the Sioux Edition. Yet housing in the Sioux Edition was both poor quality and in high demand, meaning many native people could not get housing at the Sioux Edition itself. As a result, some moved into trailer homes scattered throughout the city, including some in Rapid Creek's floodplain, and I believe, based on my research, that many continued to live along Rapid Creek. After the mid-1950s, the existence of the historical place called Oshkosh Camp within official city records becomes pretty cloudy. There's evidence, though, that the Creekside neighborhoods continued to be major hubs of Native life in Rapid. Police, for instance, still made arrests in a place that at least they called Oshkosh camp, at least as late as 1959, several years after its supposed removal. And oral testimony maintains that many Native people continue to live along Rapid Creek even after the mid-1950s. It's unclear the extent of Oshkosh camp uh, as we get into the 1960s and early 1970s, but it's likely that rather than removing the neighborhood, a 
attempts by white rapid Sidians at removing Oshkosh instead merely scattered its residents to both the Sioux Edition on the city's north side, as well as to smaller, more dispersed camps along Rapid Creek. The fact that so many Native people perished in the 1972 flood is, I think, perhaps the clearest evidence supporting this likelihood. Regardless of the neighborhood's physical extent, Oshkosh lingered in the minds of whites in Rapid City as an idea, as basically a code word for poverty. By the mid-1960s, a Rapid City Journal opinion columnist could write, quote, everybody in Rapid City pays the same levy on his property, whether he lives on West Boulevard or in the Oshkosh camp, without needing to explain to readers which of those two neighborhoods represented the rich and which of those two neighborhoods represented the poor. So, and this is a picture, by the way, of the Sioux edition in the 1950s. So by the start of the 1970s, Rapid City remained a segregated place with native people concentrated in the north of the city, in the Sioux edition and other federal housing neighborhoods being built nearby uh, and along the creek, either in more transient camps or in trailer homes. This put many at very real risk should Rapid Creek flood its banks, which it has done regularly throughout the history of Rapid City. A flood in 1962, for instance, caused huge amounts of destruction throughout Rapid City, and historical flood records peg a major flood on Rapid Creek about once every decade or so. Thus, while in some ways the events of 1972 were unprecedented, they were in other ways also predictable. The night of the flood was marked by terror, by tragedy, and by bravery. And among those who saw the disaster firsthand was this man, Paul Woundedhead, who was born on the Pine Ridge Reservation in the mid-1950s, but lived most of his life in Rapid City. This is a picture of him giving an uh, uh, oral history of his memories of the flood around the 40th anniversary 10 years ago. Uh, in 1972, Paul was a teenager living with his family on Lemon Street in North Rapid, and on the stormy evening of June 9th, 1972, uh, Paul had heard warnings that Rapid Creek might flood, and he had already seen the torrential rain outside his home. The weather report, he said, was saying it's possible we might get a flood, and just looking at Mother Nature, that's how we knew it was coming, he remembered many years later. Despite the rain, Paul and his sister drove into downtown Rapid at around 9 p.m. that night for dinner. Being downtown that night meant that they experienced firsthand the scale of the disaster unfolding in their city. He said, we got stranded because the water was just flowing so heavily. It was coming all the way up to our necks and we had to get on boats and try to get to a higher area. It was all very devastating. Paul Wounded had witnessed the flood's destructive power up close and the memories stuck with him for the rest of his life. The memories, he said, are just bad and sad. And it's hard for me to talk about it because I just remember everything. And among his memories were the sounds of the night of June 9th. He later recalled, you could just hear people screaming and hollering. It was really spooky all that night. Elderly people screaming and asking for help. And we tried to help, but there wasn't much we could do. Paul's experience was replicated all over Rapid City that night as Rapid Creek's waters ran through the city's streets. To others, sorry, Sorry. To others who experienced the flood, other senses stood out as well. Um, have you ever considered what a flash flood smells like? I had never considered this before beginning research on this project. Um, Bill Sen, who was 11 years old uh, during the flood, remembered the flood's smell and spoke on the flood's smell 40 years later. He called it not exactly a stench, just a smell of earth torn apart by floodwaters. Kim Johnson also remembered what she called that smell of death permeating the air of Rapid City. And Al Clark recalled how he could smell death as he approached Rapid City by car the next day. For Sheridan Quilt, it was the smell of mud that he could never forget. And in all these different ways, the flood left indelible marks on those who experienced it, memories that would be with them the rest of their lives. And there are many stories of people performing extraordinary acts in the face of this disaster. Stories like those of Rita Rosales, pictured here, who in her own oral history recalled rescuing her mother from drowning downtown that night by holding onto her by her hair as the floodwaters rushed around them. 
or the stories of people like uh, Second Lieutenant Gary Engelstead, a National Guardsman who was only 26 on the night of the flood. Lieutenant Engelstead died with two of his National Guardsmen peers trying to rescue people from a car during the flood, or the dozens of people who supplied canoes and boats to aid in search and rescue and body recovery operations, or the three members of the Rapid City Fire Department who gave their lives during rescue operations that night. These stories of immense courage and selflessness under pressure embody the absolute best of Rapid City and the best of humanity at large. But disasters are fundamentally human events. And thus, while they can and always do bring out the best in individuals, they can also reflect the inequalities in a society. The aftermath of the flood was marked by the same segregation and racism that often defined white native relations in Rapid City in the years prior to the disaster. James Emery, pictured here, who was a longtime activist and leader in Rapid City's Indian community and was a member of the mayor's Indian Welfare Coordination Committee, remembered a few such incidents. In an oral history that he recorded not very long after the flood itself, Emery described a native couple who had come down to Rapid from the Rosebud Reservation, arriving late at night after the flood. With a curfew in place in parts of the city, uh, this put them, unbeknownst to them, at risk. In Emery's words, quote, they got here at night and they didn't know there was a curfew, and they happened to get down into the curfew curfew area because that is the only place they knew in Rapid City, the curfew area where Indian homes had been wiped out. And this couple was soon arrested and put in jail for two days for breaking curfew and their car towed away. Emory ended up spending an entire afternoon tracking down and recovering their car for them. And this couple who had come down to help and aid in recovery efforts ended up fleeing Rapid City. Emory also reported on native flood victims accused by whites in Rapid City of fraudulently claiming donated food and other relief, claiming that they had only come from nearby reservations for the free food and clothing. Beyond these kind of individual examples of post-flood inequality, there were structural problems in the relief effort as well. The federal government's Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, agency stepped in to supply temporary homes for those individuals and families whose residences had been destroyed. Most flood refugees lived in HUD trailers located around Rapid City, and the government permitted them to stay in these temporary homes until they were able to find permanent housing. Almost a year after the flood, however, many Rapid Cityans were still unable to find permanent affordable housing. As Hazel Bonner pictured here, a representative for the United Renters Council, a local renters advocacy group, reported to a congressional hearing on the disaster and its aftermath in 1973, uh, Bonner said, quote, the people still remaining in HUD trailers are by and large lower income people, unable to find affordable housing in Rapid City, and many of them were native. Soon after the flood, a group of citizens formed the Rapid City Indian Flood Victims Association, or the RCIFVA. This ad hoc group sought to ensure that uh, relief money went to Native victims and also help ensure that local and national relief efforts met the needs of the city's Native population. RCIFVA representatives also testified at those same congressional hearings in 1973. Among them was Edgar Lonehill. Lonehill said, quote, in general, it is been our observation that there has in fact been some discrimination against Indian flood victims in the wake of the flood. Native flood refugees, which Lone Hill estimated at around 250 to 300 Indians, were again, and I'm using his words here, primarily segregated into two camps around the city. Lone Hill claimed that the segregation uh, 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 came from a desire, as he reported to the Congressional Committee, quote, of the white police and HUD to keep an eye on us and pointed out that the Indian trailer courts are flood lit at night. One of these sites was a National Guard base known as Camp Rapid, where a year after the flood, 15 native flood refugee families still lived. Lone Hill himself lived there and reported on several incidents of what he called gross discrimination on this National Guard base. One such incident involved National Guardsmen shooting blanks and conducting very loud training exercises near the section of the camp set aside for Indian flood victims. The Guardsmen harassed us continuously, Lone Hill reported at those same hearings. They would scare the kids and the old people, and they could have been practicing in other areas far removed from where we were housed at the time. On another occasion, Lone Hill recalled that he and his wife heard an explosion on the base, and upon investigating, they found that a hot water heater had burst in the men's bathroom, flooding the area in knee-deep water. 
Lone Hill alerted the National Guard officer on duty, uh, uh, who, according to Lone Hill, arrived on the scene allegedly drunk and belligerent. Lone Hill said that the guard told him, quote, you damned Indians have raised enough cane around here. We're going to evict you in the morning and all of you damned Indians will be out here with your baggage. Lone Hill's experience exemplified the inequality baked into flood relief efforts. HUD supplied hundreds of disaster relief trailers designed for temporary use. A year after the disaster, by the time 1973 began to end, 31% of those still living in disaster housing were people of color, the majority of which are Indian, according to the flood's uh, congressional report. HUD rented trailers to flood victims for $45 per month, which with utilities often running as much as an additional $40 per month. That's too much for anyone who has to live on social security. It's too much for most of our people, Lone Hill reported to the Congressional Committee. Other housing inequalities came with the Small Business Administration, or SBA loans, given to business owners and homeowners as part of the federal disaster relief package. By the time the September 30th deadline for loan applications had arrived, $85.1 million in home and business loans had been approved with an average payment of over $10,000 per loan. According to their own data, however, the SBA distributed only $1.3 million of that money to native people in Rapid City, or 1.5% of the total, out of a native flood victim population of 13 to 20%, and that percentage only being the, of those who had died, not those who had lost property or were displaced, which was a number that was perhaps far higher, and to my knowledge, was never counted. Moreover, the relief effort prioritized rapid cityans who own homes and businesses, who were mostly white, rather than the city's more mobile, less economically secure native population, most of whom rented. Even if rapid cities native victims were able to acquire relief funds, they found it more difficult to use them in finding housing. Hazel Bonner testified before Congress that there is, in fact, discrimination in Rapid City against minority groups, particularly Indians. Bonner explained to Congress that Rapid City, after the flood, had an overly crunched housing, uh, private housing market, with rent prices skyrocketing as the displaced people moved out of HUD trailers and into newly found residences. Bonner described an experiment where, quote, we sent a white tenant and an Indian tenant out there to get a list of private rentals within two minutes, or excuse me, within 10 minutes of each other. The white tenant got three possible places to live while the Indian tenant got nothing. So between expensive HUD housing, the inability of many Native people to even apply for SBA loans, and the rampant housing discrimination on the private market, we found it, Lone Hill said, we found it very often that our people got discouraged and left town after the flood. In the months and the years uh, following the flood itself, Rapid City, of course, undertook a project of intensive urban reinvention. Opinions on how to rebuild in the city were divided. In the late summer of 1972, Rapid City's local government commissioned a sociological report designed to be a comprehensive analysis of the communities affected by the flood and to issue possible uh, solutions to how to rebuild after the flood. And this report's findings described a native community that was in dire need of assistance within a city that was itself ready to reinvent itself. The flood, provided Rapid City with an opportunity. Prior to the disaster, the homes along Rapid Creek were, according to this report, said to be inferior shacks, which were often rented out by absentee owners at extremely high rents. With those units destroyed and dozens of families rendered homeless and with relief money pouring in, the city government had an opportunity to build new fair priced housing better integrated with the city's geography. Attention should be given, the report indicated, to locating these units throughout the city and affordability should be paramount as the cost, the high cost of living might, provo might prove a hardship on poorer families. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I'm gonna say that last part again because I could tell my voice was kind of cracked. The report said that attention should be given to locating any possible new low-income housing units throughout the city and that affordability should be a paramount concern since higher costs of living might prove a hardship on poorer families. Yet studies like this one were not entirely heated. Within months of the disaster, local leaders had agreed on a $300 million aid and reconstruction plan for Rapid City in the Eastern Black Hills region. 
Local urban planners also designed a new centerpiece for the city's future, building the Greenway, a green belt along Rapid Creek's floodplain, meant for both recreational space and to prevent future construction along the dangerous floodplain, the dangerous path of Rapid Creek. By 1975, the project was well underway with 1,400 parcels of land purchased uh, uh, and being converted into parkland. Among the other construction projects built with aid money were a flood memorial, federal office building, an art center, a post office, a high rise office building, and a civic center. But the Greenway was the centerpiece. Um, and remains today a central part of Rapid City's urban environment, a kind of physical embodiment of the city's ethos of never again, never again letting people live in the floodplain and being at risk of perishing in a disaster like this. Some of those parcels of land that were turned into parkland had once been Oshkosh Camp, and the flood had destroyed all of the transient housing along the creek, which had been a goal sought by many white Rapid Cityans for decades. The Rapid City Journal put it bluntly that the flood of 1970 completed the removal of the low-income neighborhood along the creek, it wrote in a flood retrospective. Some of the flood relief money did indeed go toward housing. Sheridan, uh, excuse me, Sheridan Heights, a housing development on the city's west side, uh, was one such neighborhood, which through funding from HUD acquired land and refurbished and moved flood damaged homes for low income residents of Rapid City. And by the mid 1970s, Sheridan Heights contained 48 homes, including those belonging to 18 native families. But these 48 homes were not enough. The Pennington County Housing and Redevelopment Commission estimated that 300 new low-income homes were needed to house the city's poor residents, and that number was before the flood destroyed many additional homes. Because of the displacement of those living along the floodplain, other existing Native neighborhoods quickly became overcrowded. In the Lakota homes, part of the federal housing neighborhood in North Rapid constructed in the 1960s, the waiting list for housing grew from 28 families in the year before the flood to 70 families in the year after the flood. So what are we to make of the flood's legacy uh, uh, in Rapid City? In some ways, this is a story um, of Rapid City's leaders failing its most vulnerable population in the wake of a disaster. Concepts like the Greenway, while admirable and even worth emulating elsewhere, were not conceived with environmental and housing justice in mind. With so much money going towards civic improvements, not enough housing was built to solve the housing crisis, which plagued Rapid City prior to the flood, which was embellished by the flood itself, and which is still a crisis in Rapid City today, a city with a homelessness rate triple the national average. Yet, of course, that's not the only legacy. The post-flood story is also a story, I would say, of visionary redevelopment. While imperfect in its execution, creating park space along Rapid Creek to protect against floods and to ensure people never again would live in danger should Rapid Creek rise, I think was, frankly, a good idea. Moreover, the heroism and the generosity shown by so many in Rapid City during the flood and in the days that followed cannot and should not be ignored. People are capable of extraordinary things when their neighbors are in danger. And the 1972 flood revealed a true sense of community in Rapid City. The flood also fostered a spirit of activism in Rapid City and in the Black Hills in general. The American Indian Movement cited the flood and its inequalities woven throughout it uh, throughout the recovery as one of the reasons why they chose Rapid City and the Black Hills as a crucial hub of protest throughout the 1970s, culminating in their teaming with white ranchers and environmental activists as the Black Hills Alliance in the late 1970s and early 1980s, who were able to successfully stop uranium mining in the Black Hills. That uh, uh, indigenous-led legacy of activism continues in Rapid City to this day, with groups like the NDN Collective fighting for Native rights, sovereignty, and land. So to close, I hope my presentation's message is clear, and that that message is that history is complicated that even tragedies like the 1972 Rapid City flood are complicated and that it's possible to embrace that complication, to recognize the good alongside the mistakes, to recognize the resilience and celebrate the resilience while also looking head on at the errors. The flood revealed some of the best and also some of the worst of Rapid City and that both can lie next to each other alongside one another is at the very heart of history's power. Only by being truthful about what 
happened in 1972 and the years that followed? Can we create a better future for all people who live along Rapid Creek today? Thank you very much. Um, and I look forward to hearing your comments and your questions. Mike, can you hear me okay, Steve? Can All, you right. Hear me? All right, so if you guys have a question, we want you to talk into the mic so that Dr. Hausman can hear you. Um, Steve, I, you probably didn't hear, but you did get a nice round of applause here. Would you guys reduplicate that for me, Dr. <laughs> Hausman? All the special effort signing in on Zoom. So I'm looking around for hands that might have a question for Steve. Or a comment as well. I mean, I'll say that my research on this is ongoing. And I think that part of a historian, part of being a historian is being humble. Um, I don't think that I have all the answers. I've done research on this. I feel like I, I, I know some about the flood, but I'm always interested in other people's perspectives as well. So even if you have more of a comment than a question, please do feel free to share. I'd love to hear your perspectives on the story that I, I told here. I've got one coming for you, Steve. I wish I could see you all too. <laughs> <laughs> Here you go. Um, sir, um, my name is Don Barnett. I was mayor of Rapid City during the flood. And my youth had a lot to do with Oshkosh camp. I lived uh, with my family in a house that was market value of about $3,000 mm -hmm. behind the power plant on West Rapid Street. Many of my playmates uh, were from the families who resided in, in the Oshkosh camp. But you've left one serious, serious uh, dimension. Many of these Native American families live there so that they could, during the winter, go to school at Lincoln Elementary School at the basis of Skyline Drive. Gotcha. I and my friends played ball together, we're, we were too young to be big bigoted, and the conditions and the architecture of the uh, Oshkosh camp is unfortunately very accurate by your presentation. But there was old fashioned damned bigotry mm -hmm. that drove for the destruction and relocation of the Oshkosh camp. These white, people, and a lot of them went to my church. They were on the city council and represented some of the most reactionary and ultra conservative people in the city. They felt if they could get the Oshkosh camp out of central Rapid City, they could put it three and a half miles north where the dairy farms were located and there would not be water, sewer, or any other utilities there. And uh, Black Hills Power and Light was not eager to extend power that far north because of the customer per mile ratio that they had to con contend with as a capitalistic company. Um, I don't like the mood of some of your conclusions. Um, because you've left out a significant number of homes that were built by the Pennington County Housing Authority. The Housing Authority was not bigoted. They were led by uh, Republicans and Democrats appointed by the county board because the city determined that that would be the local unit of, of government that would provide these types of, of homes. The good news was we went out and uh, we worked together with the city and the county planning and purchased some family, some land that had once been owned by the Hauk family and then it was owned by the Robert Connect family and it was right next door within 75 yards of the Arrowhead Country Club along Sheridan Lake Road. Mm -hmm. And many of those houses were re relocated from the partially destroyed houses in the floodplain. And many, many Native American families were given the opportunity to live there. And there was very, very little neighborhood protest. I only had one call at City Hall 
from a white family that said, well, we're sure going to sell our house if you're going to move those damn, damn, damn minorities near our home. And the rest of the people let the world go by. They were not greeted by bigotry or anything else. But that was only the beginning. There were also three or four, I can't remember exactly, high-rise structures built for elderly. And the, the, of course, Native Americans could qualify to live there. But, but the other issue was 300 additional homes were built in scattered locations, not sewer plant sites and, the, and not bad areas. But then instead of clustering 50 or 60 units here and there, they scattered them throughout the city with the encouragement of the city planning commission. And a lot of that alleviate, a lot of that action helped reduce the minority housing questions facing our city. So nobody should say we didn't make an honest effort. Did we fall short at times? Absolutely. But we did make a cohesive effort. David Blair was appointed by the county commissioners to be the director of the Pennington County Housing Authority. And he was later decorated by HUD for some of the most progressive and wonderful low-income housing facilities in the nation. You're welcome in Rapid City. We're big boys and girls. We can listen and learn, but that's my point of view. And I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Barnett. And uh, I, I gotta say, um, not being able to meet you this week is uh, one of my biggest regrets for having come down uh, uh, sick just before coming out there. And I'm, I'm so grateful that you you uh, uh, were willing to stand up and give, give your perspective. Um, I don't know if you can tell, but I was, I was kind of taking notes to a lot of what you were saying as, as you were talking. So I really do appreciate you, you, you talking uh, 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 about um, what you experienced as one of the, the major city leaders during this event. And I think in particular, the fact that you, you know, remembered playing with children from the Oshkosh camp speaks to the fact that this wasn't just a slum, right? That this was in fact a community, that people lived there and made lives there. And they, as you kind of indicated, sometimes chose to live there in order to uh, uh, to, to access better education. Um, as for the question of housing, um, the story that I told was based on the evidence that I I've seen. I would love to at some point get a chance to speak with you either in person or over the phone to get more information about this other housing that you said was built after the flood. And I wrote down some of what you said so I can do more research on my own. Um, I had not found that in my own research, but history is an ongoing process, right? Just because I haven't found it doesn't mean that it didn't happen. And to have you say it tells me that maybe I'm looking in the wrong places. So again, I really appreciate you sharing your, your, your wisdom and your experience there. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Steve. Thank you, and Don. Thank you, uh, guys. This is why we're recording this stuff too. I mean, there are stories. There are all kinds of stories about this event and these perspectives. And so, I I, I think that um, we haven't had enough dialogue about these conversations, and that's really the driving force behind why did we why did we say let's 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 get Dr. Hausman. Let's talk about these conversations. We haven't spent enough time. In dialogue. I've got a hand up in the back here for you, Steve. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. I have two, one comment and one question. Uh, the comment is in your presentation, you talked about Sheridan Camp. And I'm wondering if that isn't the housing development that is out on Sheridan Lake Road next to Arrowhead. Country Sheridan Club. Heights, yes. Yeah, that, that was one of the housing developments that, that was built in the wake of, of the flood, yes. Okay. Um, my question is, how did you get interested in this flood, this research? I mean, what is your background that you highlighted this area in this research? Thank you. Yeah, and I'm so glad you asked that question. And I'll be upfront that I'm uh, I'm an outsider to Rapid City. That's one of the reasons why I try to go into this research being humble and trying to, as much as I just talked for like 40 minutes straight, I try to listen more than speak with too much authority on this because I'm not from Rapid City or even South Dakota. I grew up in New York State and lived all around the East Coast and Colorado for a long time. Um, and how I got into it was 
I've always been interested in questions of environmental justice and environmental injustice. And um, as I was doing my PhD and looking for a topic to write about, um, I came across, I was interested in the story of Mount Rushmore um, originally, and I was interested in uh, Lakota ideas about sacred space pertaining to uh, the Black Hills. And while doing research on the Black Hills, I came across a couple mentions of this flood. And this was a, a huge disaster. 238 people at least dying. And I couldn't believe that I had never heard of something that happened only, what, 15 years before I was born. And the more I read about it, the more I found out about, uh, about the history of this tragedy, the more I found out about how it was intertwined with uh, inequalities uh, uh, in, in rapid city and with uh, uh, urban native history, the more fascinated I became with it. Um, so uh, I wish I had less of a kind of pro oasic answer to it, but but that's kind of how I came to it, it was just, I, I stumbled across it and I couldn't get it out of my mind. And I'm so thankful that that's, that's been the case because I found it to be an immense, all the conversations I've had with people in Rapid City about the history of the flood have really uh, uh, emphasized to me that this is a worthwhile story that more people should know about. I tell people about my research a lot and often people outside of South Dakota, not even in the, in the West, outside of just South Dakota will say, geez, I was alive for that. I don't even remember that happening, which tells me that this is a story that needs telling. And I hope I'm not the only voice telling this particular story, but I'm grateful that I can be one of the voices telling this story. I'm going to look around the room. Hi, this is Eric Abrahamson. Uh, Steve, thanks so much for your presentation, and Don, thanks for your comment. I just wanted oh, hi, to, <laughs> I just wanted to back up on that part, part of what you were saying, Don, to, you know, I think you mentioned this, Steve, but Rapid Cityans had rejected the idea of public housing for decades before you were mayor, Don, and, and I think that's an important context to bring. I think, in a sense, underscoring your comments, it is, tr is really remarkable what you and your colleagues were able to achieve with public housing, given the historical background. You know, you mentioned, Steve, the, um, the project that Darcy McNichol had championed back, I think it was 1949-50, of building a sort of um, way station kind of place where natives coming from the reservation could settle into rapid city and find employment and all of that and mayor i chase just rejected and said we can't find a place in town where anyone would have that in their next door to their neighborhood so i think it's really important to remember that the flood was in many ways a, a break point a change point mm -hmm. that, that you know to overcome some of this bias and discrimination, even though obviously it persisted, but it was yeah. remarkably different afterwards than it was before. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I agree with that. And and in all honesty, I didn't know that Darcy McNichol was behind that that proposal. That's really good to know. I, I made a note of that to, to, look, to learn more about that as well. And yeah, I, I, th I think, and and I hope that, that this came across my presentation, perhaps it didn't. I think that what Rapid City was able to accomplish was pretty remarkable in the wake of the flood. And I think that, and I, I think you, you said it yourself, Mr. Barnett, that, you know, that you all tried very hard to get more public housing built. And even if it wasn't enough, what you did do was remarkable. And I hope that both those statements, that the, the not enough aspect with what you were able to do, view that as a success, I hope that those can exist side by side with each other. That's my goal. That's my thinking on it. I'm looking to see if there's anybody else who has a question. Um, I think, again, here's, here's the big conversation point. The research continues. The gathering of information continues. I know Corey and I briefly talked. We talked about, well, how is the journey going to continue to keep researching? I mean, and Steve mentioned, you said at least 238 lives the fact of the matter is, is there's lots of trailers, houses that were things that were never found again. So mm -hmm. we keep searching. We keep searching for history. We keep looking and we keep having conversations like this here today. So again, would you guys all thank yourselves for being here? A big round of applause for Dr. Hausman, his research, Mayor Don Barnett, Eric Abrahamson. I appreciate it. everybody. Pretty educated audience today, Steve. You were uh, in a tough room, I think. <laughs> All right, so a brief update on what's happening here today. We're going to take a little break. 
Uh, South Dakota Public Broadcasting is going to, we're going to do a premiere of a documentary tonight here at 6.30. Um, I think reservations, people can still slip in, Corey. Okay, so that'll be at 6.30. We're going to close the theater for a little bit, but we're going to keep the exhibit open. Uh, and we've got some, we're going to, we'll have a little ceremony, but if you need to slip away and get something to eat, We've got cookies, but it won't tide you over all night, okay? Although I've tried. <laughs> uh, but we just appreciate all of you being here and being a part of this. We hope you come back, come see the documentary premiere, SDPB. I think uh, maybe Johnny Sumby, Seth Tupper, are they out in the lobby? They're out in the lobby. You can meet them. You can see the exhibit. Thank you all for your support of everything we're doing here today. Um, quickly, too, tomorrow, June 9th, everything's at the Monument panel discussions. Don Barnett will be speaking tomorrow night. Uh, tonight after our movie's done, 7.30, 8 o'clock, there'll be a performance at the Memorial Band Shell by the Rapid City Band. Uh, we'll just keep you going hour upon the hour. So thank you all. Thank you all so much.